check one, two. Check, check, one, two. Testing, one, two, three, testing.
considering it, which I am certain the court isn't going to do, and makes any attempts to strike it under Stockmeyer, uh, we have requested that a new PSI be issued, and that would continue to be our request at this point. Um, I don't know if the court can proceed with sentencing, but order a new PSI to be generated before a, a judgment of conviction is signed, but at a minimum we would seek that, uh, and a maximum we would seek passing this in order to have that prepared and corrected. But we. We've been informed by the court that of your intentions with respect to that matter. Mr. Stanton? I have no objection to striking the 10 1995 reference on page 4 of the PSI as a racist And that will be the order of the court, page 4 of the PSI, under, under the heading of juvenile arrest state 10 1095. That is stricken uh, from the PSI, and that will be contained within the judgment of conviction if that item has been stricken. Your Honor, definitely, um, we would object to, in the case information titling, he's consistently referred to in the PSI as Elton Milton, Eric Milton, now AKA David G. That is not an established AKA or, or um, a monitor that's been registered or utilized. In fact, what's interesting is if you go into page two, defendant of information aliases, they list Eric Mouse Jr., Eric Milton Mouse II, Eric Milton Mouse Jr., and that's where, if they were going to include this AKA Davy G, it would have been in the A, uh, KA part of Alien. So we would have asked the court to strike that throughout his generalized description because that too potentially carries with it negative connotations as he moves through. And there's no gang affiliation. This was a, a name that a few people had referred to him because he was dabbling in the music business. Specifically, what section has that yeah, information? It starts on the first page, the case information defendant, Eric Milton House, AKA Baby G. And we would move just to simply strike the Baby G part. And then as you move on, every time it mentions his name somewhere, uh, formally, it also says the same thing. Uh, on the top of each page heading that's in bold, page, every page, Eric Milton House, AKA Baby G. That's just what they, it's constantly referred to and stated. And we would just move the court to strike that part on every page, other than where it should have been but isn't, is under aliases. Does the state have any information that the defendant is either a gang member and that's his moniker? or that he has used Baby G as an alias? Um, he clearly, in this uh, very thorough investigation, a number of his friends and associates uh, refer to him as Baby G. He mentions that during his interview with Detective Mogg, who was present in court this morning. Uh, I can tell the court that in Detective Mogg's uh, comprehensive investigation, there is nothing about these acts or Mr. Nausch's behavior that I would be referencing from a very young age to the time of his arrest that indicates that he was actively involved in a criminal gang and certainly nothing involving this case or the event that occurred two days later with him and a knife that's the subject matter of another case in this district court uh, was not gang related whatsoever. All right, I do know in page three under gang activity slash affiliation says none reported, which is, is accurate. Uh, the mere fact that some of his friends refer to him as Baby G doesn't, as far as I'm concerned, uh, doesn't apply to any alias that he has put upon himself. And so I, I will 
have that uh, stricken from the top of each of the page where it says AKA Baby G, as well as on page one under case information. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything else? Yes, finally, you know, we have uh, an objection to particularized arguments that are anticipated that are in the state's sentencing memorandum that were referred to in an interview by Mr. Stanton following our hearing last, last week. If we could approach on a judge a little further. All right. I'll staying on the record if the court doesn't mind. Why don't you have Mr. Brown here, Mr. Stanton here, so we can make sure Stanton would be scooted up there. And we approach just in case so we have a chance that the judge actually... We, we have some microphones here from the press. Can they be turned off just for this bench conference, please? <coughs>
housekeeping matter, the parties come to an agreement as far as credit for time served. I believe they were arrested on different days. So. Yes, Your Honor. Pursuant to the court's directive, uh, and I sent uh, this information to uh, both defense teams who affirmatively got back to me that the information about the two remains in the court is accurate for credit for time served uh, to today's date, that is the 22nd of December. As it relates to defendant Nausch, his arrest date was 219 to 15. That's 673 days credit for time served. As to defendant Andrews, his arrest date was March 20th, 2015, calculated to today's date at 644 days. Mr. Brown, do you agree with the 673? Yes, sir. And Mr. Tomchek, do you agree with the 644? All right. All right, have, have a seat, uh, counsel. All right, uh, defendant Nash is hereby judged guilty of murder in the second degree with use of a deadly weapon. Defendant Andrews hereby judged guilty count one, voluntary manslaughter, count two, accessory to murder. Any argument about a state? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, there will be three members of the Myers family uh, to address you at the close of evidence to you at this hearing. Uh, Ms. Myers' uh, two children, Robert and Crystal, and then her husband, uh, Bob. Uh, Judge, I'd like to uh, make some comments collectively about both defendants that I think applies equally to both, and then the individualized comments from the state. Mr. Hamner and myself, over several times of meeting and discussing this case, were struck by a couple things. Number one, both these individuals, uh, the, the comments that you're about to hear from the defense team representing uh, both defendants is going to be about the tremendous amount of family support, uh, friend support that exists in the community as we stand here this morning. I want to point out to the court that all those people, and to a person as I go through all the letters, are the same people that were around in support of these two defendants on the day Ms. Myers was killed, the day she was murdered. And so I don't think that that should lead this court to any solace in, in the fact that that is going to change much of anything. And in addition to that, that that same family and friend support structure existed in the days, weeks, and months preceding this one. And in that time period, the evidence is overwhelming that both these defendants are very troubled individuals. In different ways in some regard, but an inescapable conclusion that they're very troubled. If an incident that we see in the media had occurred, one of those ones of the mass incident of the loss of life. And if these two people committed, one would not have far to look into their background to sit there and say, everybody should have seen it coming. As a, as a perspective of who the character of these two people are, it's slightly different for each one. Let me address Mr. Andrews first. Time of these events, he's 28 years of age, and for him to have a friendship, whatever it's based on, the argument in the memorandum is that it's the commonality of a loss of a father at a young age. It's clear that that's probably true, but to have an ongoing relationship as close as they did is disturbing in and of itself. The fact that Mr. Nausch uh, not only had uh, that friendship as the clearly older of the two, the claim in the sentencing memorandum uh, by Mr. Tomchak, page three, that Mr. Nausch is, is in, in essence a scared person at the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong individual, is completely belied by what I think is the most compelling insight to his true character. That is, the time that he's interviewed by Detective Cliff Mock, a no more experienced detective that has ever worked this valley. He looks at Detective Mog, who then outlines to him, after numerous questions, were you involved? Do you know Mr. Nash? 
what did you do, where were you? The, the standard questions that you would expect in an investigation like this. He looks him straight in the eye and with an unflinching gaze and tone of voice, denies it all. And Detective Mog lays out for him piece by piece of evidence that puts him at the scene, that puts him with Nausch before, during, and after the murder of Ms. Myers. And the most compelling part of the interview, one that as I watched live uh, outside of the interview room, I was thunderstruck when Mr. Nausch, after this, Detective Mog, or Mr. Andrews, after he lays out all the evidence piled up against him, Mr. Andrews, in a condescending, arrogant fashion, looks Detective Mog in the eyes and says, oh really, let me write that down. That's who Mr. Andrews is. Not what you're going to hear in a few minutes about a scared person with a great family surrounding him. This is a guy who has virtually no record. I agree with that. All the more disturbing from the state's perspective about who he is. He's unemployed. He drives after the five shots that are fired at the Myers car. It's clear, it's unequivocal. He has knowledge that there's a weapon in the car. He has knowledge that it's in Nausch's hands troubling and dangerous combination, and yet he willfully, deliberately, intentionally drives him to complete the murder that he does. There is no mitigation. He drives away. And both of these defendants, during their interviews, when it says, tell me your version of events, protect one another. That's the depth of the relationship, not some casual thing meeting over the commonality of his deceased father. Uh, I would respectfully submit a report from Mr. Andrews Ward, a necessary, a necessary and critical component that without that, Ms. Myers is not murdered. And that he do every single day, a four to 10 on the voluntary manslaughter and 24 to 60 on the accessory because he is, as that offense is defined and described, guilty in an incredibly bad set of facts that I think warrants the maximum punishment and that it be consecutive in nature and serve this in the day. As far as Mr. Nash goes, um, I think the compelling question for this court in the relatively simple door number one, door number two, of a second degree murder sentence under the laws of the state of Nevada is the distinction, a massive one potentially, in the life sentence of door number two is what danger does Mr. Nash represent to this community? And I think, I, I don't know how any reasonable person can come to a conclusion other than the inescapable conclusion and facts that support it, that he's an incredible danger. As he sits here today, that evaluation is based upon uncontroverted facts of an evaluation of him from a very young age that he has significant and repeated homicidal ideation. And that ideation is in killing multiple people in open public venues. That's who he was and is as evaluated through the majority of his life. And as I'm sure as the court can appreciate, when he's evaluated in that, no one has any idea what's going to happen in the future and how significant that assessment is. Because it's wrong. It's unfiltered. It's the one that sits there and says that, and it's not an assessment, it's what he said. It's what he did. It's not some DSM-5, some licensed clinical psychologist that gets on his Ouija board and comes up with that conclusion off the DSM-5. Those are his words, not once, not an isolated event, but repeated. And once again, in very public environments, and with multiple people, mass killing. 
That, I think, is compelling. Then the question becomes is, uh, what happens to this individual when he goes to prison? Is that going to help him when Mr. Nash gets the opportunity to be paroled? If he is paroled, is he going to be more of a danger or less of a danger? And I would submit that, once again, we all hope the prisons <coughs> help people, that they learn lessons. But there's not only no evidence to suggest that Mr. Nash would ever learn that lesson on his own, but every indication that based upon his personality, his mindset, the way he thinks, his true character, that he's going to be a more dangerous person when he gets out of prison. And I don't think that's, I think that's an inescapable conclusion that has to be drawn from the facts for this court and from his own mouth. He's a gentleman who at the time of Miss Myers' murder, his only employment, if I can even use that term, is that he sells drugs at a middle school. He repeatedly lied to the detectives during the interview for over an hour. The gun, the murder weapon, is still outstanding as we sit here today. He shot at Miss Myers with a 45 caliber handgun 20 times, in excess of 20 times, mandating after the five shots at the Myers car to begin with, when two people's lives and others in the community, the public street, that he reloaded at least twice. <coughs> he told his mother after his arrest, that this was the, was the result of the cartel. That in his I'm sorry, as the car? Cartel. Okay. That it was part of his explanation that it was primarily defense of others, as he told Detective Ron, that he believed the Myers vehicle was driving back to threaten his family and his home. And it is true that the Myers home and the Nash home was in the exact direction that he would have observed the Myers vehicle returning after being shot. But the claim that the cartel was after him and the claim that someone had threatened his family and his younger sibling is absolute fabrication. And it's documented once again clearly as there could be no truer and accurate terms than Augustus Klaus's sworn testimony before this court a couple weeks ago, that what he thought was mitigators is now aggravators. Because his assessment of homicidal ideation and paranoia blows any chance of his claim of self-defense or defense of others out of the wall. It's dead. And he knew it. And that's why he made that statement. So that's his mindset. It's the cartel. And I think, like Mr. Andrews, his character is on display in his interview with Detective Bob. Mr. Nash's character is on display by an event that occurs two days later. And in context, this is undisputed. This man tells his best friend, who he confessed within hours after the murder, that he had died. He has watched the massive volume of media that is now national news, and certainly here locally. He knows Miss Myers is dead. He knows who it is by name. He claims, and I think it's probably true, that he knows Miss Myers that he has no animus towards her. And what does this man do? In 48 hours, he's standing on a busy street in the middle of the day, walks across the street, and holds a knife to the neck of a juvenile, knowing that he had just committed a murder, that it's all over the news, 
it was someone he didn't intend to kill, and she's dead. That's his character cruelty, and you can't get around it. It's inescapable. The final uh, thing about Mr. Nausch was on display in the front of this court twice. The JVD hearing and the motion to withdraw where he was called and put under oath. This is a gentleman who, prior to giving himself up on this murder, with a SWAT unit being told, the SWAT unit is on its way, once they get here, it's out of my hands. Remember that from the officer who testified at the JVD here. What does Mr. Nausch want to do? He wants to smoke a bowl of weed before he gives himself up. And that's who this guy is. He is an individual that took the oath that clearly this court rejected in its evaluation of the credibility and the truthfulness of his testimony on two different occasions, had to, by your <clears throat> ruling, flatly reject virtually everything that came out of his mouth. And then after the last motion hearing, Mr. Nausch gets on at least two television stations and does an interview and says, I'm not even there. They got the wrong person. That's who you're sentencing. And Judge, I can't think of, and my argument would have been relatively the same had we sent this, uh, Mr. Nausch prior to his motion to withdraw. But I don't know what evidence I would have had other than what I just outlined to suggest the life sentence is appropriate. Now with what this court knows about his mental health and who Mr. Nausch was and how troubled he was and how deep-seated that was, and you saw from the records the amount of effort and resources that was put forward in counseling. Uh, his poor mother had to show up every single time down at Monta Vista when he's threatening that he's going to kill people. She's got to be at her wit's end. This is the same family that is going to be argued to you should give you some solace that there's support around here and that he's not a threat to the community. And of course, that support was not enough for Mr. Nash. He's a very troubled person and represents an active and ongoing threat to this community in a very significant and severe way. I don't see it being uh, alleviated. In fact, I think if he ever does get out, and I'm pretty sure in my knowledge of prison math down the road, he's going to get out. They need to be very careful when they do let him out but I think the life sentence would at least be an appropriate thing based upon his troubled past and who he is and the character that he lacks. With that, I'll submit to Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Mr. Andrews, before I sentence you, do you have anything to say? Yes, sir. Do you want to stand? Yes, sir. I can't begin to imagine what your family has gone through for the past 22 months. In my eyes, no one deserves the anguish of losing a loved one. I wish from the bottom of my heart I could read my hand at the time, but I just can't. I wish I would have trusted the detectives to interview me, but I was just very scared and didn't know what to do. I want to apologize to the course my, for my behavior and the two detective law for my behavior that was arrogant, misleading. I'm not going to make any excuses for what I did. I take full responsibility for my actions. I spent over a year and a half searching my heart for the right words to describe how much sor sorrow I had in my heart for what happened that night. And there's just no words strong enough to describe what it really happened. I can only hope and pray that your family can accept my apology. I know you're I hope your family has some closure now after sentencing. I know your family will never forget the tragic night of February 12th, and neither will I. And that's something I have to live with for the rest of my life. Robert, Brandon, Crystal, please find your hearts to forgive me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Andrews.
Mr. Nauch, do you have anything to say before I sentence you? Yes, Your Honor. I understand we're all here at the sentence to sentence me today. I want to first offer my sympathy to everybody here who is here on behalf of Tammy Myers before I make any comments or statements. I also want to acknowledge everybody who is here to support me as well by thanking you all for showing up here today and giving me the courage to stand up and speak for myself. I would like to begin by saying I do have a prolific case in this whole I do have a prolific case in the severity of it has my life and liberty on the line as I stand here today. The whole time I've been putting my thoughts and efforts towards my, my guilty plea withdrawal, that I'm yet to have full opportunity to prepare for a sentencing. Not to be a burden to the courts, but the truth is I am arguably not ready for the court to sentence me today. Defendants are given a 60 day window to, uh, for preparation and sticking to the notion of being, uh, and sticking to the notion of being ready. Your Honor, I have only been given 13 days to prepare, and I have been having complicated issues. Surely you have given me more days prior before making a ruling on December 6, uh, December 9th of 2016. But as I've said, those days and moments were all invested towards the arguments I have raised. Regardless of the results, I have given it my 100% focus. Only since December 9, 2016, after you made your ruling, did and was I able to look past those arguments and move forward. Maybe in some cases you could fast track defendants who may believe they still remain adequate counsel, but I ask that you avoid the days that you may believe I have to grant me new ones. Due to the fact that I am a defendant who is confided in the solitary housing, I am only given one chance, opportunity to come out of my cell for one hour every 24 hours due to the magnitude and the publicity that my case has always received. I have only had one chance to make calls during business hours because the time I am given to come out of my cell can vary from, one, from 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. and so on. That time is up to the institution and not me. I am young. Even though I have made some claims already, the fact that I have been bringing forward and addressing ineffective assistance to counsel, I may have overlooked some important matters that need to be put on the record before you sentence me. I can lose my grounds for an appeal on certain issues. I can be sentenced to a harsh sentence when there might be things that I'm yet to discover that can mitigate my sentence. Not looking to slow the courts, but I am alone in this matter. And I need an ample amount of time to work through everything so that I can properly prepare for properly be prepared for sentencing. This is my own doing. Therefore, as you can see, my preparation is worth anybody else's and much needed. The problems that may arise from a continuance today is nowhere near the magnitude of the problems that may arise for me if, I, if you do not grant me more reasonable time to prepare. The law clearly states that the district courts should grant a defendant prior to sentencing him a continuance if the defendant can show, reasonable, uh, uh, can show a just reason for it. For someone of my age and knowledge of the law, two weeks was not enough. My attorneys can only plan to be prepared. As of yesterday, they just came to see me. This is why I have asked to speak for myself and, and need more time so I can be ready. Not wanting to, to be quickly pushed through this and put in a worse position to help myself. Please understand my concerns for more time. My reasons are fair and justifiable and, and aren't at all frivolous claims. You just not too long ago made a ruling that was not in my favor. This is my last chance to put everything on record to my knowledge. I can see my counsel's reason to proceed today. It can only bring in closure if they truly have in some way been ineffective. This is my life. By a life being something that cannot be replaced, please don't substitute it for anything other than what it is. Because this is all I have left to take with me as I go away a convicted man seeking justice. Once again, my offerings, and my offerings of sympathy goes out to Tammy Myers and everybody that is here on her behalf. I ask that you all do not mistake in the fact that I am asking for my rights by portraying me as if I am overlooking her life, because that's not the case. 
and I can show you that. For you all, and for her, is part of the reason I've made this a speech, and not just a statement that could be shorthanded and downplayed as if I'm the only person that matters here today. Your Honor, I would also like to put on the record here today that Mr. Stanton, Deputy District Attorney for the State of Nevada, has been making personal comments and speaking unprofessional about me when his duty is to only bring forth the true facts of the case. I hope that Your Honor can cons also consider this and make fair decisions on my behalf and understand that I am not this person that Mr. Stanton is making me out to be. As the assailant who is involved throughout this case. Setting aside the case, I ask that the court have consideration for me as a person who still has rights. Rather than just some menacing monster and criminal who has no rights and to be, and, and to be allowed a fair and equal opportunity with the court of law. I ask for you not to send me up unprepared because it is, highly chan it is a highly chance that I could be stuck being a guilty man for a remainder of my life that being said, I ask that Your Honor grant me a minimum of 30 days continuous today with that I submit. Mr. Nash, you entered your plea March 4th of this year, approximately nine months ago. What other items do you wish the court to consider after nine months? Well, there's, you know, like I said, I put all my focus and time into withdrawing that guilty plea that I'm not ready to be sent to stay. I'm not, I don't have certain things that need to be brought to the court's attention. I haven't had time to sit over and look over you know, things for myself and for, you know, the family and for everything in this court today to be considered for my sentencing. I only come out an hour a day. I've asked the seals multiple times, multiple times to let me out, you know, at a reasonable hour during the day or at least let me out for a five minute phone call to my counsel. They deny it every time and tell me that they have to go by the list, the list is a list. Okay, you haven't answered my question. What other items do you wish this court to consider? That's the thing. There's 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 certain things that I need to do, and there's certain things that need to be um, that need to be found that I know are there. Like I said, I put all my focus and all my attention on withdrawing this guilty plea. Like any reasonable person, it was in the process for nine months of going through a process to try and withdraw his guilty plea. I didn't sit and prepare for sentencing because I didn't think that my uh, motion would be denied, especially for the reasons that were put on record. So I have not, and I haven't had a reasonable amount of time to prepare for sentencing. It's been 13 days. Four of those, two of those aren't, aren't even business days. All right, thank you, sir. Court den is denying your request to continue the sentence, and I would note for the record that your entry of plea was March 4th, 2016. You were interviewed for the PSI some date prior to April 15th, and if I recall from our hearing to withdraw your guilty plea, at or about that time when you were discussing the case with the writer from the Department of Probation, I, I think, to, for lack of a better way to put it, that's when you received your buyer's remorse. But you've had since March 4th through the present day to uh, advise uh, both your previous attorneys and the attorneys that we have here today of what items you want to present to the court. They have prepared a very uh, detailed, thorough sensing memo, and I've reviewed every uh, report, letter from family members, friends uh, on your behalf. They have been reviewed as well as the sensing memo for Mr. Andrews. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, anything from counsel for Mr. Andrews? Yes, Your Honor. On February 12th of 2015, the Myers family, through no fault of their own, was forced to endure something that no family should, and probably every family's worst nightmare. So, and Your Honor has the monumental task of making a decision about the sentencing of two defendants. And I would suggest to the court that based on the totality of the evidence in this case, these two defendants are very, very different. There's only one defendant in this case who pulled the trigger. There's only one defendant in this case who has a previous history of violence. There's only one defendant in this case, as Mr. Stanton recited for the court, had ideologies of mass homicide. There's only one defendant in this case who has denied his liability for his 
involvement in the homicide of Candidate Myers after first admitting it. There's only one defendant in this case who has put the Myers family through an additional eight to nine months of grief and the failure to achieve closure. There's only one defendant in this case who's taken every opportunity he possibly can to put his face on TV and talk about as he's termed it his prolific murder case. That defendant is Mr. Nash. And to the extent that we can on behalf of Mr. Andrews, we would encourage the court and echo the sentiments of the state to pick up the biggest book you can and throw it at Mr. Nash. But there's another defendant in the case, and that is Derek Andrews. He's the only defendant in this case that has kept his mouth shut since he was arrested, has turned out every request for an interview, has desired not to put the Myers family through any more pain, who accepted responsibility and pled guilty, who in all the intervening nine months, while his case wasn't on calendar and Mr. Nausch's Nausch was, sent his counsel to court to remind the state that he wanted the negotiation he had entered and wanted to take responsibility and be sentenced. That's Mr. Andrews. So who is Mr. Andrews? The state, it's interesting in their argument, tries to preface their comments by saying, hey, this is what counsel is going to say on behalf of Mr. Andrews. And it's no secret. We filed a very voluminous sentencing memorandum about who he is and what he did prior to this incident. Um, he's an individual who has had jobs. He has been to school. Um, and while Mr. Stanton talks in depth about the use of the word troubled as it applies to Mr. Andrews, What's really interesting is what we agree on, and that is, while he may have been troubled through some circumstances that were out of his control, he has, for the most part in his life, remained trouble-free. His PSI indicates he's got no criminal history. That's who came into this situation. He's an individual who volunteered, did volunteer work, fed homeless people, was involved in environmental causes, all on, on his own. And while Mr. Stanton would suggest to the court, hey, he might have support from friends and family now at sentencing. He had it when he committed this crime. But what's really interesting is that he had that support through the entirety of his life up to the point he was 26 years old and remained trouble free with that support. The thing that changed for him is when he became involved with Mr. Nash. Derek Andrews does know Mr. Nash through a meeting, a happenstance meeting at a party, where they discuss with one another something they do have in common. When you talk about Mr. Andrews being troubled, it's a reality that I believe it was his ninth birthday, his father didn't show up because his father purchased a gift for him, wrote a suicide note, and killed himself. That's something that has haunted Mr. Andrews. And when he met a younger person who shared that same loss, yeah, he involved himself in that person's life. But the idea that Mr. Nash and Mr. Andrews were best friends or spending a lot of time together or out running the streets of Las Vegas couldn't be further from the truth. They knew each other through a party. What happened is on the date of the homicide, Mr. Nash, paranoid and causing problems, reached out to a couple people to come pick him up. One of them happened to take the call. That was Mr. Andrews. So Mr. Andrews and Mr. Nash were together. And that starts the hands of time that Mr. Andrews indicated to the court he wishes he could unwind, but he can't. He can't undo the fact that Tammy Myers was killed when Mr. Nash shot her. Mr. Andrews can't do that. But what he has done since he entered his plea is constantly maintain overwhelming remorse. Those words that he just read to the court, they weren't written to the court by counsel. In fact, prior to this morning, Mr. Nelson and I had never told him what to say and never seen those words. He's sincere in his remorse. You'll notice, as Mr. Nash was up here in his diatribe about how the system is unjust to him and that no life can be returned, Mr. Andrews sat there in tears. He's full of remorse for what he's done in this case. There are two huge mistakes and lapses of judgment that led Mr. Andrews to be where he is right now. The first was his association with Mr. Nash on the morning of February 12th of 2015. For that, he takes absolute responsibility. The second was a month later when he wound up in a homicide interrogator's room. And as Mr. Stanton put it, Mr. Mogg is very experienced. And Mr. Andrews, although he put on a facade of arrogance and indifference to the incident, was terrified. 
Of course he was. Four weeks had passed. This case had been all over local media every day. It had been the lead story on national news. He knew that he had driven the car when Mr. Nash fired those shots. And he was terrified of the repercussions, and he was terrified of what could happen to him should he be charged with this crime. That's a natural thing for someone with no involvement in the criminal justice system to be scared of. He said things he shouldn't have. If he had kept his mouth shut, he may not have been charged with the crime he ultimately was. And certainly the state, as evidenced by their argument, would have a different perspective about him. But he did accept responsibility. So the question before the court today is what is the appropriate sentence for Mr. Andrews at this juncture? Certainly the court has a range of punishment that you could impose. The maximum sentence is what the state is asking for. But to do that, you would have to impose a sentence in excess of what the PSA writer recommends. The PSI writer who looked at the totality of the circumstances of this case, who considered the impact of the victims, who considered the previous criminal history of Mr. Andrews, who considered the police reports as to his involvement in this circumstance, recommends concurrent time between counts. On behalf of Mr. Andrews, we have the ability to argue to this court for a probationary sentence. These are probationable crimes, and there's nothing in the plea agreement that says we cannot argue for them. But Mr. Andrews is not going to insult the Myers family for their loss and tell the court he's deserving of probation for what he's done. He's going to ask the court for a period of incarceration as a sentence. He knows he'll be labeled a felon. He knows he's admitted responsibility for homicide, and he knows he's going to prison. <clears throat> Those are consequences to what he's done in this case, and he understands that he faces those consequences with his acceptance of responsibility. So what's the appropriate sentence? If you look at the range of punishment, I would submit to the court a concurrent sentence is appropriate for this case. The snapshot of what Mr. Andrews did in this case is limited to a very small period of time and a wayward interview a month later. A concurrent sentence is appropriate. So is Mr. Andrews the worst of the worst individuals who have come before this court on a, on a voluntary manslaughter charge? I would submit to the court he's not. Certainly you've seen individuals that have a criminal history, that perpetrated the violence themselves, that have indicated things to the court that make them more of a danger to society than an individual who has donated his time, remained trouble-free, been in school, and things of that nature. So in terms of the sentence that's appropriate, I would submit to the court it's not a maximum sentence of four to ten years, it's something less. What we're asking for the court to do on behalf of Mr. Andrews is to impose a sentence of two years on the bottom for the voluntary manslaughter charge. And we would submit to the court's discretion as to what that top end should be. Such that when, because we know that if he survives in prison, when he gets out, he will have time hanging over his head that the court can be assured that he toes the line and reverts back to his performance in society prior to this incident. And on behalf of Mr. Andrews, we would extend our deepest sympathies to the Myers family and ask the court to do this. All right, thank you. And for Mr. Nouch, who's going to handle that one? Hi, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. What do we do, Judge? The task is, is left to you. Um, I submit this is not a life case. And I had every intention this morning of being prepared to handle the comments of Mr. Stanton and dealing with the prosecutor in this case and wasn't expecting to. But I guess some old habits, some habits die hard. Um, with respect to that, I think it's interesting because Mr. Andrews has obviously saddled their arguments based upon the relative um, culpabilities to Mr. Nash, and, that, and that's rightfully so, but he's also parroting information that's inaccurate and, and, and inappropriate, which I will get to uh, when I address those comments by Mr. Stanton. The state would have us believe, Judge, that um, this case was a violent disaster waiting to happen. That's what he put in his sentencing memo. That Eric Nash was acting in some predetermined homicidal fantasy. What is this based on? Certainly not the facts of this case, which I, I plan on getting into if the court will indulge me. It's certainly not on his past criminal behavior, notwithstanding Mr. Tomczyk saying he's the only one with a violent criminal past that doesn't exist. There is no violent criminal past. He has no arrests for violent behavior. He has no convictions. He 
He has no misdemeanor convictions. Juvenile, his involvement in the juvenile system is non-existent. He never participated in it. Uh, the lone exception is the one that Mr. Stanton referenced after the fact. Mr. Stanton didn't reference it in today's remarks, but he constantly referred to him as homicidal, being homicidal. And in statements that he made previously, he said since the age of six. And I think if your honor re reviews the reports, that that's what they refer to. When he was six years old, he started, he started counseling before, but at the age of six is the first report where a third party reported to that doctor something that may have been said by Mr. Nash. That never went investigated, it never went followed up. It was put in the report that there was a homicide of ideation about trouble and frustrations he was having with people in the church. But it was never ferreted, it was never investigated, it was never followed up. Why? Because it wasn't criminal. It, the entire therapeutic pr uh, process was that, to improve him, to give him opportunities to speak um, to professionals, uh, to help his mother who was raising a child with ADHD. That is the actual diagnosis. There was another incident in 2007, I mean in, when he was seven, maybe another when he was eight. If you recall reading the memos of the state, their references to aggressive behavior stopped in 2008 completely, and the references to homicidal ideations before that. So when he was younger, he made a couple of statements that were put into reports for other healthcare providers to review, to do an analysis on, to provide a treatment plan for him, not to be used in some forensic criminal process because the lingo, the terminology is different. It's dangerous to take that information in its isolated um, moment and apply a broader scheme by calling him homicidal. And we only need to look at the arguments of Mr. Tomchik to, to, to realize that because he parroted the same thing when he said the only one here with the homicidal thoughts is Mr. Natch. He's never read a single mental health report. He's never participated in any of the mitigation. He doesn't know the context of that. It's just parroting what the state says because the state misappropriates the information and is applying it to him as a whole. They're not just painting him with too broad of a brush. He's using a spray can and it's one color. There's not a single diagnosis in any of those reports. A diagnosis of homicide doesn't exist. The only diagnosis amongst the thousands of pages is that he has ADHD, oppositional disorder, things like that, but the, there's no diagnosis of homicide. They hand pick and cherry pick a couple of passages to apply to the court to utilize to create a cloud of fear. To create this inference to you, Judge, that you should be afraid of him. <clears throat> Even though his actual behavior in his life doesn't support any of that. Doesn't support any of the claims. It, according to Mr. Stanton, his level of dangerousness should have, should have revealed itself as a juvenile. 12, 13, 14. It didn't. There's nothing there. Circumstances in his life changed, obviously. Similar to Mr. Andrews, he had lost his father to suicide at a very young age. And when Mr. Stanton is painting this picture of him using his spray can, I think it, it obviously isn't a total picture of any human being, of any person. And Your Honor is more aware from the letters that the family had sent from the PSI, <clears throat> and if you actually had an opportunity to review a large majority of those records that were provided to the court, you can see that they are actually mitigating. They're in an effort to help him improve, to help him educationally. He had, was on educational IE plans to help him comprehend and understand information and help him get to a place where he can succeed in life. This isn't a kid that was grown up um, with all of the privileges in life. He has struggled. His family has struggled all the way through. and. It's clear that through that, he has a tremendous amount of love for his family, for the people around him. And you can see from not only the letters, but from his mother's involvement, from when you look at how she's participated in his life, from the age of eight months when he was dropped on his head with a skull fracture, that she's been there every step of the way. She too has a tremendous amount of love and support for her child. I submit, Judge, that the state doesn't have the adequate 
training, the adequate preparation, the adequate education to make those blanket claims based upon those reports that they've made. Those blanket allegations when you pull out a line that he's homicidal and therefore he's a danger now and he should never get out of prison and he deserves door number two because when he was six years old, he said something to a therapist and the therapist put it into a report. Or more accurately, somebody reported to the therapist that he had said that and they put it into the report. That's where Mr. Stanton is. He, he, he candidly told the court prior to the hearing with, with, with the Klaus brothers and his reports that would not necessarily have been his argument. His argument would have been some of the other things he pointed out, but his true argument today is, this guy's opened up, here's this great information, I want you to misapply this information as I have judged, and deem him to be some giant future threat that's not supported by any of his actions or any of his behaviors. It's clear, Judge, that the state doesn't want the court focusing on Eric's real past, the actual facts of this case. And the facts of this case are important. Because Your Honor realizes when we do sentencing, when we hold people accountable, what happened is just as important as to who's involved and what their history is. When you combine those two factors here, you'll see that he's not a life sentence candidate. This isn't a case where the only choice for Your Honor is life sentence. And Mr. Mr. Tomczyk says throw a heavy book at him, that's fine. What he pled to is a heavy book. Ten years minimum is the best he can do on the underlying charge. Your choice is between a life sentence or term, and then you have the weapon to deal with. So the book is there, Judge, regardless of what you do. Two weeks ago, following the hearing, Mr. Stanton ran to the courthouse steps and had a press conference. Within that press conference, he spoke to the media and made certain allegations against Mr. Nausch about being a homicidal maniac since the age of six. Made some other comments that, that aren't necessarily relevant to my comments to you this morning. But it was clear that he was expressing anger and frustration at him. It's clear that he was creating an environment in the community that I want you, follow me. I want you to be angry, community. I want you to be fearful of him. And why would that happen? Why would somebody do that? Because if the community is fearful, Judge, then maybe your honor would pick up on that and become fearful as well. Maybe some of that outrage would pass to the court. Because Mr. Stanton knows what we all knew, which is the court's feelings about this at the original sentencing, prior to the hearings, where the court's indication was, I not necessarily see this as a life case. Mr. Stanton knows that. So to change the game, to change the venue, he's trying to create some fear with you and the community to do something you were otherwise not earlier inclined to do. It's inappropriate, it's desperate, and it was unacceptable. So again, what do we do? What should we consider? I can't submit, this is not a life case. And this puts us right back where we were three months ago when the sentencing was taking place. This case, Judge, isn't about what he said when he was six, seven, or eight. This case is about poor choices, real fear, and some misunderstandings that William Shakespeare couldn't have come up with. This tragic story, Your Honor, begins with Tammy Myers taking her daughter, Crystal, driving in a middle school parking lot. They're driving slowly, they're driving deliberately. Also at that middle school, near the parking lot is an Eric Nash, who's very much paying attention to this car that's creeping around and driving in a very suspicious manner in his mind. To understand his apprehension, we have to be aware that for weeks, he had been telling his friends, close friends, and family that someone is out to get him. That his family has been threatened. His mother, his baby sister, has been threatened. Somebody is threatening him and his family, and he truly believes this. Um, Mr. Stanton made references to, to whether this cartel uh, was an excuse or was a rationalization, but it doesn't matter whether the, the cartel was real. Eric now should believe that people were after him, whether the cartel or others. He felt in danger, and when he sees that car, the suspicion hairs start rising on the back of his neck. Many of the witnesses who were interviewed told the police exactly that. Eric had told them that he was afraid and he was worried. He'd been telling his mother, don't stand near windows. Don't open the front door. 
His mother went as far as calling the police department, and this was verified through this investigation. She went as far as calling the police department, asking for extra patrols around the neighborhood, because Eric had been receiving threats on his texts. That took place in December, two months prior to this incident. She also took the extra step of having a friend of hers stay at the house for protection. Not because she necessarily knew that it was real, but she knew that he believed it was real, and he was scared and he was warning her. So when Eric's in the parking lot and he sees this car driving around slowly, saddled with that idea that he's being threatened, he makes some decisions. He's in the parking lot. He has a gun with him. He had indicated to the police that he had at least cocked around once while the gun was in his backpack. But he doesn't shoot this car that's driving around. He doesn't act out in some homicidal behavior. He doesn't just go forth and say, okay, the, the threat might be here. I better just shoot every bullet I have at this vehicle. He also has a cell phone. And he picks up his cell phone and he makes a couple of calls to various friends because he wants somebody to come get him. Ultimately, he gets a hold of Andrew. Andrew is the friend that comes and picks him up. His, cur his concern regarding this green car was absolutely mistaken. But his fear relative to it was real. It's also important to know that, um, well, what I'll say is the counsel for the state early on in their memo made a, made a big deal, Judge, that Eric has this thing with guns, this, this fascination with guns, but there's no evidence of it. Never been arrested of it never been picked up with a gun before. In fact, what the evidence shows us is that in the interviews of Eric's friends, they interviewed an individual by the name of uh, Chris Cadu, who said that he'd never seen Eric with a gun, never really saw any pictures of him with a gun. But what he did know was that a month prior to this incident, Eric was asking around about getting a gun because he needed to protect himself. So now we know that that's consistent with the timeline of when he was telling his mother that she needed to protect himself. He's telling a friend, I need to find a gun. It also suggests that prior to that, he didn't have any weapons or firearms on him. He only obtained one when he felt a real and legitimate threat. And if you look at him, you can see why. If you start seeing a threat, I mean, he grew up always in the 3 percentile of height and weight. He's not in a position to really take care of himself. So as unreasonable as it is, and as problematic as it is in our society, that was his remedy for protecting himself, was arming himself with fire. But he didn't use it. So now, the Myers have finished their driving lesson. Okay. Tammy Myers takes over the driving. Crystal becomes a passenger. And as they're leaving the school, there's an incident. They get in a confrontation with another vehicle. The vehicle either sideswipes them or brushes up on them or otherwise is described as cuts them off. Crystal Myers, who's in the passenger, reads over, honks the horn, you know, at that car. Okay. Um, without knowing what's really going on in the mind of the other vehicle, ultimately that car stops, spins out and stops right in front of the Myers vehicle. The driver gets out of the car, goes to their front of the car and starts making threats. He can see who's in the car and he says, you know, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna kill you and your daughter. Okay, he makes threats at the occupants that are in the car. Uh, Tammy Myers at this point, um, according to the testimony, swerves around and takes off. That would have been a good time to use a cell phone, call the police, and report what just happened. But that's not what happened. Tammy Myers drove to her house. She parked in front of her house. She tells her daughter, go inside and get your brother. And Crystal does that. She goes inside and presumably she tells her brother Brandon, we had just been threatened. Something just happened outside on the road. Somebody's threatened his mom once. He rushes, he puts on his clothes, and what does he do? He runs and gets a gun. Now he's armed with a gun and he runs out to the street where he sees his mom standing there, and he begins to assess the situation. And it's at that point that he makes what might be the singularly most reasonable suggestion in this entire thing. He says, Mom, let's go in the house. Let's go inside. Call the police. She doesn't go inside. She doesn't go inside and forget about it. She doesn't go inside and call the police. She insists 
that he'd get in the car with her. She's going to find the person that cut her off. She's going to find the person that made threats to her and made threats to her family. She's going to go see what she can do. She even goes as far as telling Brandon, listen, get in the car. If you don't get in the car, I'm going to go alone. This was a very poor decision, obviously. It was a poor decision when she decided to go back out on the roads and look for this threatening person because she put herself in harm's way. It was a poor decision when she asked her child to go with her to go back out and look for this threatening person because now she may have put her child in harm's way. And it was a poor decision when she put her child armed with a gun in the car to go out and look for this threatening person because now she's put everybody in harm's way. But if her asking her son to come and get in the car with her sounds a little familiar, it's because that's what Eric Nash was doing when he felt threatened, when he felt scared. He called Andrew. He called his backup. He called for somebody to come and help him. One has to wonder, Judge, what would have happened had they actually found the person that was in that car that had cut him off earlier? What would that conversation have sounded like? How is that confrontation going to go? I mean, Mr. Mr. Stanton might be right when he says that, that, that there's a violent disaster waiting to happen, but it wasn't simply because of the actions of Eric Nash. He wasn't the lone person involved in that inevitable uh, tragedy. So Brandon gets in the car, and he has two things with him. He has his 9mm Beretta, which was eventually used, and he's got a cell phone, which was never used. Puts the gun on it. this works. I know how this works. Remember, as Mr. Stanton said, they're driving back towards the direction of where he lives. They're going to go to my house. You've got to follow them. We can't let this go. You can't just go and hide. We've got to follow them. That threat now, now that I've shot at them and, and it didn't, didn't hit anybody, they're more of a threat. My family's more in danger than they were just 10 minutes ago. Naturally, we know he has a cell phone. He should have made placed a phone call to the police. He should have done something other than pursuing the very threat that he perceived. But if that sounds familiar, it's because that's what Tammy Myers and Brandon were doing when they went back out looking for the car at the road ridge. That's what they were doing when they chased this man's car when he fled. Fear creates a lot of poor decisions, and some of them are personal pursuing our fear and chasing them in the height of the moment without necessarily thinking everything through. And as we now know, Andrew drove into the cul-de-sac. Eric saw a man get out, was running towards the house, and he just started shooting. He started shooting at the man who was never struck. One bullet hit Ms. Myers. There were multiple shots, as Mr. Stanton said, um, multiple shots over and over until they finally fled. I believe that Brandon Myers was able to get off a few shots of himself back at the vehicle, but uh, nothing was ever struck and nobody was ever hit. After the shooting, Eric found his way over to Zach and Caitlin. Those are friends of his. Where he made it clear to them what his thought process was, what was going on in his mind, what, what he was doing. Because he says to Caitlin, I got them. I got the ones that were after me. And he doesn't say anything about Tammy Myers. He doesn't know that that's who's been shot at this point. I got them. He says um, to, to his friend Zachary that this green car was chasing me. This green car was circling me in the parking lot. And then it started chasing me. And then I saw a gun. And then I started shooting. He explains all of the details accurately from his perspective as to what was going on in his mind at the time that it happened. And it can't be argued that that was all based on the fear that he had expressed to them earlier. They saw that that's what it was. It wasn't until later that they realized they shot the wrong person that even Eric had told friends he wasn't supposed to shoot a loving mother. 
That's not what was supposed to happen. That obviously was a mistake. So again, Judge, what do we do? Where, where do we go from here? What do you do with all of this information, this, this facts of this case, which independent of everything else, don't scream out life sentence, worst person to ever plead in a second degree murder. Criminal history, which is non-existent, certainly doesn't scream out. Life in prison, worst person to ever have been pled or convicted of a second degree murder. And, and when you only have two choices, that's what you do. You have to, this person is, is the worst, or this person deserves an opportunity. And so what do we do? And I know that the Myers family is going to speak, and, and, and I know that, the, that Your Honor takes, takes their words very seriously. And we're all heartfelt. And, and, and society itself is struck when a tragedy, especially an avoidable one such as this, happens. But there seems to be this misplaced association, Your Honor, in, in all of criminal uh, law that relates to the punishment of the accused and applies to the victims of the crime that they value themselves, their loved one, based upon how the judge sentences. Like if for some reason you don't give a life sentence that that's a recognition or a devaluation of Mrs. Myers, and that couldn't be further from the truth. We know that because our legislature has set it up this way. There are degrees of crimes for that very reason. Uh, people who are lost lose their life due to the actions of others in involuntary manslaughter, manslaughter, uh, DUI. And within those ranges, we recognize that the human flaws of people and that instances happen. And within each particular area, such as second degree, you're given further latitude. You have discretion. And when people feel that way, we understand it. I mean, it's emotional. We emotionally get why somebody would associate that. But the court also knows, and the court is aware, that you're the neutral lover. You make these decisions free of passion and emotion. You recognize the emotional elements, the emotional pitfalls, but you always apply reasoning. And you apply common sense. And you apply justice. The facts of this case, again, Your Honor, suggest 25-year sentence. And then you have a weapon, and I'm going to recommend to the court that you add an additional five-year sentence to the back end of that. And, and so what I'm saying is 30-year sentence. And I want the court to understand when I'm speaking in terms of time, I am speaking in terms of the actual sentence. Parole eligibility is nice. Parole eligibility is a good time and it's important to clients and the accused. But what comes down to the actual sentence, it's kind of illusory. Because we're not in control who does the parole. We're not in charge of who decides when somebody is in release. We know from the law that he has to do every day of 10 years before he even gets the opportunity to ask somebody else if he can do more time. He's been alive 21. He went into jail at 19. So, so far, that's just half. I'm asking the court to impose a 30-year sentence, not the life sentence, the back-end sentence. It's 150% of the time that he's been on this earth is the actual sentence I'm asking this court to impose. If he's fortunate, if he's lucky, he gets an opportunity to ask somebody to consider parole at a minimum of 11 years. One year for the weapon, 10 years for the crime. Um, that would be, as I said, a significant portion of time relative to how long he's actually been here. And I know that as Your Honor sits here and weighs everything and, and you're waiting to hear from the Myers and we're trying to juxtapose what justice is and what time is, that you'll be mindful of relative justice. Other cases, other cases that have been before your court, other facts similar to this one, not the anger, not the fear. I would suggest that fear is the reason we're all in this mess in the first place. And to continue to function and make decisions 
based upon the creation of fear, or the implied suggestion that we should all be afraid, again, leads to more poor decisions. This decision, unfortunately, just like the others, can't be reversed. I'm asking your honor to make full and careful consideration when entering the sentence. I'm asking your honor to sentence him to a 10 to 25 years. And I'm asking your honor to consider giving him a one year sentence for the use of the deadly weapon, and five years for a total of 30 years. And with that, Judge, I submit. Thank you, Mr. Brown, I have one question, and Mr. Stan, if you disagree with Mr. Uh, Brown. What was the distance from the first shooting on the street to the cul-de-sac? Blocks. I couldn't say specifically, but if, if Mr. Stanton knows that, the welcome in the From the first shooting to the Myers cul-de-sac? This all takes place in a relative right. confined area of outside neighborhood. It's, se it's several blocks. It's within the same, what you would describe and consider the same neighborhood, but it's several blocks away. Yeah. All right, thank you. And Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. Stanton brought up the um, other case that was part of the negotiations. I didn't know if you wanted to address. Well, Your Honor, it's an interesting dynamic how that case came I mean, I'm about. only sentencing him for this, but I look at the I total package. I understand, Judge. And, and again, when we took over this case for purposes of evaluating the withdrawal of plea, the facts of that case weren't provided to us. Um, we're familiar with them. But in the limited time that we had to prepare for the sentencing to do a, co a, a comprehensive evaluation relative to that sentence and apply it here was going to be a disservice. What we do know is that that case was not an active case that was floating about and it was inevitable. It was still kind of in screening. They were able to link him to that and the facts and details of the case, um, I would rely on the, on, on the court to conclude and actually ask that you allow Ms. Uh, Jennifer Tagliati, Judge, to do the ultimate evaluation of that because the the derivative of the case, as I recall, was only because this one happened and it was tossed in for negotiation purposes. And, and the, what was the time frame again, Mr. Stanton? You brought that up? Two uh, days. Before or after? Ah, after. Okay. And you agree with that, Mr. Brown? I do. Okay. All right. Anything else, Mr. Brown? I do not agree. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Counsel. And we have a couple speakers. Uh, who will be first? Robert Myers. So why don't you come on up to the witness stand, please? Good morning, Your Honor. Oh, sir, why don't you come up here? And we'll have the witness sworn in. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be that? Yes, ma'am. Please state and spell your name for the court's record. My name is Robert. My last name is Myers. It's R-O-B-E-R-T. Last name is Myers. M-E-Y-E-R-S. Thank you, sir. Go ahead. Have a seat. Good morning, Your Honor. Kind of been a hard past year going on. Um, did lose a wonderful mother. And I do want to say she was a great mom, and a lot of stuff has been said about her, and I don't want to get into that. Just want to say my brother that everyone brings up about this. He, I know what his intentions were, and he had no bad intentions going out. And I know him, he was just trying to be a hero of the family. And when he got back to the house, it was just a whole different story. And my sister is the one that takes it the hardest, the most, out of all of us brothers and sisters. She's the one that takes it the most because that was her best friend. And honestly, she was all of our best friends. She was the one to go to, and it's pretty sad we don't have her for this holiday that's coming up, and we kind of really didn't do anything on Thanksgiving because it was just all about her, and it's just been hard, and do you want to say it, Your Honor, do you want to please go up to the full sentence? And that's pretty much all I have to say. All right. Thank you, sir. Yeah, 
Yes, Your Honor, is crystallized. Please raise your hand. You do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. <coughs> Please state and spell your name for the court's record. Crystal Myers, K-R-I-S-T-O-M-E-Y-U-S. Go ahead. Have a seat, ma'am. I tried for hours to figure out what I wanted to say. And I come to the conclusion that I can't say anything to bring my mom back. He took her from me and it was finalized with her last breath. On February 14, 2015. So because you didn't think of the time that I would lose with her, I'm not going to further waste my time on you. You took a gentle soul, a grandma, a daughter, a wife, and a mom. Your brief moment of stupidity took so many precious moments to come from me. Eventually the pain will go away, but the hurt that you've caused this family is permanent. Every birthday, every anniversary, every holiday, I will be reminded that she's gone. <laughs> One year and ten months, I have been waking up wishing it was a dream. Wishing that she was still here, wishing I didn't have to face the reality that she was really gone. Wishing I could hug and kiss her one last time. It's been a rough almost two years growing up without my mom. It's been rough facing media, facing the two guys that have taken my mother's life. Every time I walk in this courtroom, it starts all over again. It's been dragged on with the same two people, and they truly didn't know what it was really doing, nor did they care. Every time I walk in this courthouse, I picture her laying there in her lifeless body that I couldn't bring back. Your Honor, they took my best friend, my mother. They took the memories we were supposed to have with her. Your Honor, I ask you, so please don't give them a chance to take another beautiful human being out of this world. Don't give them a chance to put another family through heartbreak and misery. Your Honor, please give them back to me. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And when, one, one more speaker, Mr. Stanton? Yes. All right. Bob Myers. Do solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in this action shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God. Thank you. Please state and spell your name for the court's record. Robert Edward Myers, R O B E R T. Edward. Uh, sorry, your E D W A R D Myers N E Y E R S. Go ahead, sir. I was married to my wife for uh, 24 years. We knew each other for. Uh, two weeks and then we're married. Um, we have four beautiful children, two beautiful grandchildren that she'll never get to see. Heard a lot of things. There's a lot of things that we as a people don't know what happened that night. But we do know one thing, that a good woman, a mother of four, a wife, life was taken. We do know another thing that the defendants had a way out. First time they fired shots and weren't fired upon, they had a way out, Your Honor. They could have left. They decided to pursue and, and, and murder. That was their goal. I've heard a lot of testimony today how 
Now, sh there's no remorse there. He's an animal. You know? Now, it, I know his attorneys are doing their job. They're doing a damn good job for him because he, he's not going to do it. There's absolutely no remorse from that animal. And for anybody to say there is, there isn't. There's, there's three families here suffering. There's the Nauschers, there's Andrew's family, there's my family. And we have to live, us as the families, on what these two animals decided to do that day. And they had a choice to leave, Your Honor, after they didn't kill anybody. They had a choice not to pursue because they weren't being pursued or shot at. Today I hear from Andrews, I appreciate your, your candor today, but until today I've seen no remorse from him. I, I've not seen it. Am I going to forgive you? Never. Ever. Neither one of you will get my forgiveness. And especially Eric now. I hope for me and mine, you burn in hell and you get what you have coming to you today. Because you, mister, are an animal. And you can have your little smirks like you've had in court. And I've had a sit here and put up there. Mr. Myers, please address the court as to the impact. the DA's office, even the attorneys. I might not like you, but you're doing a job, you know. But when it comes to one defendant more than the other, I will hand that to your honor. Please don't show no mercy on that animal. He deserves a, a deal that's been struck. He got a deal. My wife didn't get a deal, your honor. My kids don't get a deal, your honor. My daughter saw this happen, your honor. My son saw this happen. How do you erase that? I have a son who can't even cope with life and can't even come here today, but he would have let him come here. That held his mother's brains, Your Honor. My children had to see this. You know what? I've been living in this community pretty much my whole life. And if we don't send a message today, Your Honor, us as a people, what are we telling to the next victim's families? Our, our, our city's turning into the garbage, Your Honor. And I ask you for my family, I need to mention one more thing that I forgot to. This took more than my wife's life. Her mother died six months later from grief. She couldn't come back from this. Her father died two weeks ago from grief. They couldn't come back from this. My father-in-law made mistakes so kept watching the news. And every time he had to watch the news and hear this guy in his comments, it was enough. He was enough. He quit. They're both gone. It took so much more. My daughter is probably one of the strongest women that I'll ever meet in my life. For her to get up here today, I, I don't know how she did it. I don't know how I did it, or my other son, you know. But I ask you for our family, Your Honor, to please give the maximum sentence of love today and send a message to these other animals out there that they can't do this no more. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, that would conclude the state's victim uh, impact evidence for this hearing. All right, thank you. Your Honor, can you approach? Yes. JR, can you take the microphones, please? Thank you.
Mr. Nash and Mr. Andrews, please stand. This is probably the worst chain of events that, uh, or one of the worst chain of events that this community has seen. One thing that troubles the court, Mr. Nauch, is something uh, that you've said and what your attorney highlighted was that you felt you had no way out. Well, you put yourself in a position to have, you thought you had enemies. You put yourself in that position. You put yourself to have that firearm. Both defendants have uh, provided many letters of support from family, their own family members, um, former friends, uh, employers. And I've reviewed the records for both defendants. And it's clear that both defendants have had troubled backgrounds. But their troubled backgrounds pales in comparison to the trouble that's caused the Myers family. And the reason why I asked the attorneys about the distance of the first shooting to the second shooting is again, we could have had a break in the sequence of events. If Mr. Nash, you truly felt they were, these people were after you for whatever reason, whether it's for drugs or just some road rage individuals, the smarter thing would have been to go home. Or to, if you want to go home, if you want to protect somebody, go home and protect your family. Don't chase after them. And Mr. Andrews, you knew exactly what was going to go on. We're going to go get them. And you drove them there. This, this wasn't a situation of, I didn't know what was going to happen. I think both parties knew what was going to happen, both defendants. Mr. Andrews, on count one, the court says you can find in Nevada Department of Corrections for a maximum term of 120 months, minimum term of 36 months. On count two, accessory to murder, the court sentenced you to maximum term of 60 months, minimum term of 24 months. Count two to run consecutive to count one for an aggregate sentence of 180 months maximum term, 60 months minimum term. You're also ordered to pay a $25 administrative assessment fee, $3 DNA collection fee, $150 DNA fees with the DNA testing, $250 to the Indigent Defense Fund, and you are ordered also to pay restitution amount of $2,480.18 jointly and severally. And if I didn't already mention it, 644 days credit for time served. Mr. Nash on the second degree murder with use of a deadly weapon. What's particularly troubling to me is the first shooting because numerous shots rang out and are on the roadway and there's other vehicles perhaps, there's homeowners, there's other homes, other family members. And then you told your friend, maybe it was his idea, let's go follow them, let's go find them, let's go get them. And you're in a cul-de-sac you know, have homes and other family members that you put in danger. The court sends you to a term of life in prison with possibly parole beginning after 10 years. On the weapons enhancement, a consecutive term of maximum term of 120 months, minimum term of 48 months. You already pay a $25 administrative assessment fee, $3 DNA collection fee, $150 DNA fee spent to DNA testing. $250 to the Energy Defense Fund, and you have 673 days credit for time served. Thank you, Council. And a restitution of $2,480.18 jointly and separately with the co defendant. Thank you, Council.